in the entire uh, book of 2 Corinthians, in the entire book. Uh, this is what we're coming to today. Uh, and so you're really going to have to pay attention. I gave each of you uh, who are members and, and attenders, you got an email from me earlier this week, uh, and it talked about some passages to read, Exodus 32 through 34, Jeremiah, as well as Ezekiel. Uh, and then I uh, told you to read Hebrews chapter 8 through 10, all right? And the reason I told you to read those is because if you didn't read those, you'll be ready for today. If you didn't, you'll probably have to go home afterwards and you'll read it and then you'll go, oh man, that's what that is. That's what that means. So when you jump into 2 Corinthians and you open your book and you just say, well, let me just jump right in here. I probably wouldn't jump into 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 6 through 18. Okay? I wouldn't do that the very first time you just jump in. I, it wouldn't be a good thing because it's going to be kind of confusing to you if you don't know some background history. If you don't know the text, you kind of jump in there and you're like, I really have no idea what he's talking about. All right? Uh, so, and you may have read... You may have read those passages, and you may still be sitting there going, I have no idea what he's talking about. Well, Lord willing, before you go home today, you'll understand this passage and what he's talking about. Uh, because it's just not real easy and clear as you're reading through if you don't know some facts going into it, okay? Uh, so I didn't want to let you know that. One of the facts, for instance, one of the facts that we read about is when Moses came to get the law. When Moses came to get the law... And he got the law, you remember, God's hand had wrote, written the law down for Moses, and he got the law, and he came off of the mountain, Mount Sinai, and he came down, and what were they doing? Do you remember? They were worshiping a, a bull. They were worshiping a false god. Already worshiping a false god, because he didn't come down exactly when they thought he ought to have come down. And you remember Aaron... Aaron says, hey, I'm sorry, I don't know what the world they're doing, but, you know, they just gave me their gold, and I threw it in the fire, and this thing came out, and here's what they are doing, you know. That didn't happen. Uh, Aaron, come on. You know, we're not all stooges, and Moses surely wasn't a stooge. He knew exactly what went on. And so, what did he do? You remember what he did with those two tablets? He broke them. You know there's consequences when we break things that God makes? And I know what I just said. You kind of you, you giggle. You know, yeah, that's... we in America don't look at sin the way God does at all. And I'm talking about we in American churches don't look at sin the way God does. You probably would have a different view had you had a son that never sinned and came and gave his life for everyone else. Your view of sin would be totally different. So what we're going to talk today is about law and grace. And grace is better than the law. Grace has always been better than the law. And it will always in the future be better than the law. But let me tell you, the law is not bad. For without the law, I would not know that I was a sinner in need of a Savior. So now I got your attention. Let's go to the text. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning reading in verse 6. Who also, he's talking about God, okay, verse 5 says, Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. Verse 6, Who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. But if the ministration or ministry of death, written and engraven in stones, was glorious... 
so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? The word rather is more glorious. For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more did the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect, by reason of the glory which excelleth. For if that which is done away was glorious, much more than that which remaineth is glorious. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. Uh, when I read that, I always say, that's funny because I have no idea what you're talking about. You, know, you read this, you're like, okay, we have great plainness of speech. Why aren't we using it now, right? You're like, what, what's going on? Well, we're 2020, okay? We are 80, 60, okay? So we're, we're, we're a ways away from there. We've got to be reminded of what's going on and what it went on. Verse 13, And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. But their minds were blinded. For until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the Lord of, a spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. Behold the King in tiny infancy, as Magi fell before His majesty. The time had come for David's promise there to free us from the grips of Satan's sin.
out, this is by far the most difficult passage found in 2 Corinthians is the one we're dealing with this morning. Uh, and it does not stand alone. I want you to understand this. The passage that we're dealing with now doesn't just stand alone here. It affects the entire uh, Word of God. From Genesis to the book of Revelation, what we're going to be talking about specifically this morning is going to affect the entire Word of God. It's just that it is extremely hard to explain uh, and to for people to grasp the first time that they read 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and be able just to take it in and say, yep, got that down, let's go. Because uh, it's a very difficult passage. No sooner did the gospel of God's grace begin to spread among the Gentiles that you saw another religion pop up. And we called that the Judaizers. You remember this. This is a word that you've heard of. It's Judaism. Uh, the Judaizers were the ones that pr uh, promoted Judaism and the study of the law, but they also added something to it. And they added a lot to it, by the fact. But whenever you add anything to God's grace, you're wrong. Let me say that slowly and very pointedly. Whenever we add anything to God's grace, we are wrong. God's grace is all that we need for salvation. That's it. And so what happened was in Corinth, those folks that had their letter of recommendation, they came in and they had their letter of recommendation and they started telling them, hey, you know what? We need not only to believe in Christ, but we also need, and you just name them. We need to be circumcised. We need to do this. We need to do what the law says. We need to, and all of this stuff that needs to be added in. And that's not the way of salvation. That's not the gospel. Is that not old? Today we call it legalism. We remember it as legalism. It's a bunch of rules that we've got to set up, and we've got to do these rules. And if we don't keep doing these rules, then we're lost. Well, my friend, you may have done all the rules for your entire life, and you're still lost if you don't believe in the grace of Jesus Christ for your life. And I hate to disappoint you, but that is the honest truth to you. There is no laws given that you can live perfectly and be good enough to go to heaven. It's an impossibility. And so the Apostle Paul, he loved the Corinthians. He loved them and he wanted to share with them and they know this. The Judaizers, their major emphasis was that salvation was by faith in Christ plus keeping the law. And they also taught that the believers perfected in his faith by obeying the law of Moses. Their gospel of legalism was very popular. Since human nature enjoys achieving religious goals instead of simply trusting Christ and allowing the Holy Spirit to work. I mean, it's a lot easy to measure religion than it is to really measure true righteousness. It's more difficult. And so the Apostle Paul looked on these false teachers as peddlers of the word. You remember? He said this in chapter 2, verse 17. And the religious racketeers who preyed on ignorant people, he rejected their devious methods of giving the gospel. We'll get to that in chapter 4, verse 2. And he just says, these folks are crooks. And what they're doing is totally wrong. And he's defending the faith. He's defending his own character. How did Paul refute the doctrines and practices of these legalistic false teachers? Well, by showing the surpassing glory of the ministry of the gospel of the grace of God. 2 Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and I put this up here, Paul contrasted the ministry of the old covenant law with the ministry of the new covenant grace. And he proved the superiority of the New Covenant ministry. Paul was a brilliant and a well-educated man. Yet he did not depend on his own adequacy. He depended on the Lord and the legalists told people that any person could obey the law and become spiritual. In fact, a legalistic ministry has a way of inflating the egos of people. And when you emphasize the grace of God, you must tell people that they are lost sinners who cannot save themselves. 
And Paul's testimony was, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. He said that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10. No one is sufficient of himself to minister to the hearts of people. That sufficiency can only come by the transformation of the heart of man. Have you been transformed in your heart? Not your way of thinking, not the way you do things, but in your heart. Is your heart changed, transformed? If it's never been changed and it's never been transformed, you've never been saved. <coughs> now get this clear. You will never be perfect outside of heaven. Never. Never. I will say it again because I don't want you to miss this. You will never be perfect outside of heaven. But you can live a sinless, a less sinful life with Christ. You can never live a sinless life without Christ. The law is given... And the law is not bad. And some of you bristle when we even say the word law because you hate law. The law is not bad. The law is pretty much black and white, isn't it? And when it's black and white, there's no wiggle room. And man, we can be wiggly, can't we? We like to say, you're squirming. Because we like to wiggle. But the law tells us you either did it or you didn't. Well, maybe. Well, no, not maybe. You is or isn't. You are a sinner. We are all sinners. That's bad news. But I don't want to leave you with bad news. The good news is God did something about it. There is a thing about law and about grace that's been going on since the beginning of time. And many of you have never really thought about it maybe this way, but it's been going on for a long time. As you know, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy are five books. We call those five books the... Can you tell me? See, it begins with a T and it ends with an H. The Torah. And when you translate that, that means the law. Okay? Those five books. Do you remember that we just talked about Moses wrote down and gave us the Ten Commandments? There's ten of them, right? Do you know them? Thou shalt have no other God before me. Thou shalt not make an image like me. Okay, these two look a lot alike. So don't make an image like me. This looks like the word W. It's a word. So don't take the name, the Lord of the name, uh, the name of the Lord in vain. Don't take his name in vain. Okay, that's how you remember that. Four, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Okay, that's four. Okay, five, honor thy father and mother. Okay, honor thy father and mother. Love them. Six, do you, thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not no, what's seven? Commit adultery. Watch this. Don't go down the lane like this, okay, and commit adultery. Because you've already went down that line and you've already said you're committed to one. Don't do it again, okay? Don't commit adultery. What's this one? Don't steal, okay? Don't steal. Gimme, give gimme, give gimme, give gimme. Don't steal. Don't do that, all right? And what's this one? This guy is telling these folks about these folks. So don't bear false witness. That's good, okay? You remember that? So this little dude right here is telling these folks about this folk. Don't do that, okay? And then five is gimme, 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 gimme. It is don't covet. Why? Why should I not covet? I mean, Brother Bob's got something that I want. He's got a nice truck, and I, I like that truck, and boy, I'd like to have that truck. I don't need to covet what he has. I've got what I have, and God has given me what I have. Why can't I be content with what I have? 
I'm non content because I want what he's got and God hasn't given it to me. That's not good. God summarizes it all this way. Okay, I've given you a lot here. Oh, in that five, stay with me, in those five books. Okay, then you go on from those five books and you go Joshua, Judges, Samuel, you know, Kings, you know, all those things. You know what happened in all those books? The same thing happened in all the books. This is what happened. God gave a set of rules. Don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. And what did we do? Or what did they do? They broke every law. Every time he gave a law, what did they do? He broke it. What did he do? He set up some more laws. What did they do? We're not doing that. We're breaking those. Then what did he do? Set up some more laws. What did they do? You getting a hint? I know sometimes it can be clear, but you can get the hint. Just over and 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 over, we say no. I'm going to do it my way. Has that changed today? Hadn't changed a bit. It's been over and over and over. So you get to the 12 prophets, you get to Isaiah, you get to Jeremiah, and you get to uh, uh, Ezekiel, and what's he say? He said, you know what? You keep doing the same thing. You're stiff-necked. And what do I need to do? I'm going to send you a new heart. I'm going to give you a heart that's transformed. I'm going to change you on the inside. What do we have in the Gospels? Jesus Christ has taken those laws and he's saying, hey, by the way, you think you all are doing really good. He says this. Because I know if I ask any murderers in here, everybody go, hey, we're good with that one. We're good. I got six down. I don't have any problems. The next question I'd ask, do you have a brother or sister? Yeah. You ever hated them? Yeah. Because if you don't say, yeah, you're lying. Because everyone that has a brother and sister, at one point in their life, they've hated them. And they just hated them. And so what did God say in Matthew chapter 5? He said, if you hate your brother and sister... You've already committed murder. Oh my, he took the law and escalated the law. Yikes. If I hate, I've already murdered. Are you a murderer, man, sir? Yes. Am I a murderer? Yes. The law is given so that I would understand God is holy, he's perfect. And I am not. <clears throat> and the only way that I can obey God and be pleasing to him is to receive what he's given to me as a gift in order that I would be righteous before him. Now I know what I just said was huge. It's really deep. But if you don't understand it and you don't meditate on it, you'll never really enjoy the fullness of your salvation. What we're talking about today affects the entire Word of God. Because we have rebelled against Him and He's given us grace. I love my sons, you love your kids. And you want them to do what is right. Do you realize that God formed Adam and Eve he formed Eve from Adam's side. He gave them a perfect environment. He walked with them through the cool of the day. He taught them everything that they needed to know. And he said, oh, by the way, there's one thing that I don't want you to do. I don't want you to eat of those trees, that tree. The day you eat of that tree, you die. Okay. He shows up like he always does. And he asks this question. Where are you, Adam? We were over here. <coughs> what are you doing? We're hiding. What'd you do? Well, I did what she wanted me to do. <coughs> we're really good at that, aren't we? I mean, after all, it was my brother or my sister. And this fact, it was his sister that he ended up marrying. I know that's tough. We'll get through that genetically. 
But this is the story. What does God do? He kills a lamb, provides a covering, but then what's he do? He kicks them out of their room. Ever had a parent kick you out of your room? You did what was wrong and the parent says, out. Do you know he kicked them out of their room? What did he do? He put angels in front of the entrance to the room where they couldn't come back and go, who they? Did God hate them? Absolutely not. In fact, he showed the greatest grace anyone has ever shown. Because had they eaten of the tree of life, there would be no remedy for their sin. No remedy. Now there could be. He kicks them out of the room. And now he provides the lamb that saves the entire world. It's Genesis chapter 22, isn't it, Stan? Where it talks about Isaac and Abraham and him taking him up there. And literally in that same place, I believe, Jesus Christ would give his life. And it's always pointed to Christ and Christ alone. Grace better than the law. It's all through Scripture. So how does that work? Okay, I just gave you everything. Now I'm going to break it down for you, and you're going to have to write quickly, all right? So here we go. Number one, uh, and, and I put this down uh, so that you know, verse six, look at verse six real quick. Look at verse six. Who also have made us an able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. The letter refers to the old covenant, the law. The Spirit refers to grace, the new covenant. Okay? If you don't see this, you'll get confused because he's contrasting the old law with grace. The old law with grace. The old law was glorious. Grace is more glorious. The old law did this. Grace did this. Okay? So all throughout, he's given us this, and you have to pay attention to that. Paul was not contrasting two approaches in the Bible, a literal interpretation with a spiritual interpretation. He was reminding his readers that the old covenant law could not give life. Remember this. I can give you the Ten Commandments, but they will never give you life. They can't. Grace gives life. God's riches at Christ's expense. Christ died for us. That we'd have a gift that we could have and it transforms our life and now we can live. I can live. I can actually say no to sin the very first time I received Christ as my Savior was the very first time that I could actually say no to sin. Sin won every time against me. You leave a candy bar out, and you're not around, it's gone if I'm here. Why? Because I love candy bars. And so I come by and I see that candy bar and I'm like, nobody's around. Nobody will know. I can take it. Before I say that, I do that. When I got saved, now what happens? Well, you know, Andy, you take the candy bar and that's someone else's property that's not yours and that's called stealing. Yeah, you're right. Can't do that. But maybe I get Jim to come by and get that for me. <laughs> well, that's passing the buck, and that's getting Jim in trouble, and it's getting me in trouble, and now we're double trouble. We're good at this. We're fantastic at this. Can't do that. Well, him know do right and do it not. To him it is sin. And I know it's not right to get that candy bar. I get that thing, I, I'm, I'm done. I'm not going to. I'm going to leave it alone. For the very first time, I won. Now, 
Not because of law, because of grace. You know, beforehand, I hated the Ten Commandments. Now that I'm saved, I absolutely love them. Who doesn't love them? Love God with all you got. Don't take his name in vain. Don't make any images bow down. Don't do that garbage. The first four is about loving God. The next six are about loving others. Jesus said in Matthew, Love the Lord God with all thy heart, mind, body, soul, and strength. And love thy neighbor as thyself. On those two things, hang everything else. That's pretty easy. If I will love God, I will love others. And if I love God and love others, I shouldn't have any problems with anyone. My problem is when I don't do that. When I decide I don't want to believe God. I want, to, I want to go back to what? Two religions in the entire world. This is it. Grace works. Law. Do, 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 do. Don't, 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 don't. Done, 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 done. Grace and law. They're a world apart. Only God could give the law and at the same time be gracious and not go against the law. That's heavy, Chevy. Only God could show grace and not go against the law. He's the only one. So what's it look like? Here we go. Number one, the law of Moses. The law of Moses. This is what the law of Moses gave us. These are some characteristics of it. The law of Moses, first of all, was accompanied by a fading glory. A fading glory. It's right here in the text. Verse 7, but if the ministration of death, written and engraven in stones, was glorious... So that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. For even, verse 10, for even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excelleth. You see, both covenants manifest God's glory, his holiness and his righteousness. But the glory of the new excels the glory of the old. The temporary and outward glow upon Moses' face typified the temporary and outward glory of the old covenant. It was a fading glory at best. At best it was. So it was accompanied by a fading glory. Secondly, the law of Moses led to death. It didn't give life. It led to death and it showed you that it led to death. Look at verse 9. For if the ministration of condemnation be glory... Okay, the ministration of condemnation of the old covenant be glory. Much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. You see the contrast? Right here, the law ministered only condemnation because no one kept or could keep its precepts. Nobody could. The law does not save, but only condemns and therefore can only lead to death, not life. You remember verse 6? Verse 6 we read, For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. Gives life. The Spirit does. Grace does. The new law, the new covenant does. The old one doesn't. It could never give that. It was given only to teach us, Galatians says, to teach us our need of a Savior. Okay? First, think about this. When society sets a law before a man, he has to obey it. If he fails to obey, he breaks and severs his relationship with society, and he has to bear the punishment of a broken, severed relationship. He has to be put away, cut off, separated from society. And the punishment for breaking God's law is the same. When a man breaks the law of God, he has to 
do something about his fellowship with God. He's broken his fellowship. He has to do something about that. It's the same way that the law is. Secondly, the law is only letters and words written on paper, on stone or on wood. That's what the law is written on. It is external and outside of man. It only commands. It does not give man the power to do the command. The will, the ability, even uh, the power to obey are entirely left up to the man. The man may wish to keep the commandment, but he may not have the will or power to keep it. Therefore, he breaks the law, and the law actually kills him. It should be noted that the law not only kills the man externally, but through guilt and despair, it kills his human spirit and will, sapping his energy and his ambition, his drive and hope internally. That's what the law does. All 613 of them. And if you don't understand that, talk to Brother Stan. He'll give you an explanation about that, and he'll just talk to you about what that law did to him and his family. Growing up, Having to do the law, the law, the law. And man, when he found grace, it was like, woo, this is absolutely wonderful. It's freedom. Isn't that exactly what he said? Spirit of the Lord, there is freedom. There's liberty for the freedom of the Lord. Let's move. Law was temporary. Third one. It was temporary. Look at verse 11. For if that which is done away was glorious... It was done away was it was temporary. If that was glorious, much more that which remained was glorious. You see, the old covenant or law faded away. The new covenant remains and is permanent. I like what Matthew Henry says. Matthew Henry, an old uh, Bible commentator, he says this, when the sun rises, the light of a lamp fades and diminishes. Does that make sense? That makes sense to you? When the sun rises, the light of a lamp fades and diminishes. It might be added that its function is no longer needed. The light of the lamp is superseded by a much greater light. Grace comes about and the law just diminishes. And oh, by the way, I keep saying it, the law is not bad. Christ said, I come to fulfill the law. Fulfill it. I didn't give it to you because it's bad. It's just not life transforming. I gave you my son because that's life transforming. But my law shows you your need of the son. The law, letter D, functioned as a veil restricting God's glory. Restricting God's glory. Look at verse 13 and following. And not as Moses was put on a veil over his face. Why? That the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. But their minds were blinded. For until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament. Which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. The veil... Meaning is illustrated by Moses. When the people saw the glory of God shining in the face of Moses, Moses had to put on a veil upon his face. When he went up and he was in the presence of Almighty God and God's glory was shining upon him, he came down off of that mountain looking like a Christmas light bulb in the black night of winter. I mean, it was just like, well, that's different. And so what do you have to do? He put the veil over. Why? Because that was fading. That was fading. You can always tell people that spend a lot of time with God. When they're around sin, they're not quiet about it. They speak up about it. Because they understand the importance of of righteousness and being right with God. They won't put up with it. They won't turn their head and say, well, I'll just let that go. They can't. Because why? They've been spending time with God. And God is all over them. And they know that that's wrong. And they want to share that, hey, that doesn't have to be wrong. 
God's grace forgives. God's grace restores. You need God's grace. But the longer that we stay away from the glory of God and the presence of God, the easier it is to put up with the talk, to put up with the stuff that's not glorious and that causes damage. He's saying grace outshines greatly the law in every way. Paul said, Moses veiled his face so that they could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. Paul is saying that what Moses did was an illustration of how man sees the old covenant or the law. Man looks at the law and sees that he is obey if he wishes to please God. And therefore, man works and works and keeps the law, believing all the time that he's earning the favor and acceptance of God. Man is totally blinded to the real meaning of the law. And the glory and meaning of the law are veiled from his sight. He is unable to see the real meaning of the law. He's unable to see that law was given to reveal the nature of God's glory and perfection. To see that man comes short of that glory and perfection. To see that man cannot keep the law perfectly. And to see that the law was given to show man his desperate need for a Savior. See, that veil restricted God's glory. We read about this in Ephesians 4, verses 18 through 20. We talked about this. Having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ. If you know Christ, you don't live that way. You know better. Finally, law prevented Christ's likeness in the lives of unsaved Jews and Gentiles. It prevented Christ's likeness in both unsaved Jews and unsaved Gentiles. He says in verse 14, But their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament. Stay with me. Understand this. Israel was blind in Moses' day. Israel was yet blind in Paul's day. And Israel as a nation is still blind today in 2020. Even to this day, when the sons of Jacob hear the writings of Moses read in their synagogues, the veil of willful unbelief upon their hearts prevents them from seeing that Christ came and that the law, the old covenant, was fulfilled in him. It was done in him. And I know that Brother Stan will tell you the same thing, uh, that you, you, you go and, and they read and they, the, the truth is right before them, but they cannot see it. But that does not mean individually that they cannot receive Christ. That's why we have. That's why we have an Honor Israel Sunday here. So that individually those that show up can hear the gospel for the very first time. And God can do a miraculous work in their life and transform their heart to where they read scripture and they read the law. And they can understand that's pointing to Christ. Christ is the shadow. It's, all these are shadows pointing to Christ. And they can hear. Just like it happened to you and me. Us lost Gentiles. Who would we receive Christ as our Savior? Now we go back as newborn babies in Christ and start reading God's Word for the very first time. And the letters on the pages start just jumping out at you. And you're like, man, I never saw that before. Wow, that's me. That's talking to me. That's, that's who I am. Because why? The veil is taken away. What does that? Grace. God's amazing grace. 
takes the veil away. And I can see clearly for the first time. When you get a hold of that, it just overwhelms you. It's like, oh, that is so true. I didn't see it before, but I see it now. He's so gracious to allow me to see it and to allow me to dig in and just dive into his word and read it and believe it and understand it. The law has never saved and never will save because it cannot save. The law is on the work side of grace and works, grace and the law, new covenant, old covenant. The law, legalism, none of that can never save. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace are you saved through faith. That not of yourselves, not of works, 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 do, 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 don't, 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 don't keep, 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 keep going, keep going, work hard, 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 hard. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, a gift of God, not of works, lest any man or woman should boast. By grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Now notice the superior choice. We're going to run through these quickly, all right? So hang on, here we go. We're going to go snow sledding down the hill. Okay, right here we go. So... You got the law of Moses, now you have the gospel of grace. The gospel of grace. Remember, he's contrasted these all the way through. Here he goes. The gospel of grace. First of all, it's accompanied by an unfading glory. Unfading glory. The glory never fades. It's unfading. Look at verse 10. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excelleth. The glory that excelleth is the grace of God that excels that glory that was fading away in the law. The temporary and outward glow upon Moses' face typified the temporary and the outward glory of the old covenant. While the permanent and the inward glory and glow of the Holy Spirit in the believer's heart typifies the permanent and inward glory of the new covenant. The law loses its glory in the presence of the gospel just as the moon loses its glory in the face of the sun. Now, everybody understands that. You get here early on some uh, morning uh, with me before the sun comes up and you'll see the moon. And then all once that sun comes up and you start looking at that moon, you start to go, okay, this one's fading. This one's just as shiny as all. This one's fading. And all at once, boom, it'll be gone. What happens? The sun far out, out glows the moon. Does the moon help at night? Sure does. But it's nothing like the sun. Because when the sun comes, you can see everything. You can see everything. And so it has an unfading glory. Well, let's second, uh, grace leads to life. Grace leads to life. Look at verse 8. How shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? That word rather is uh, it means more or greater. Okay? So how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be more glorious, be greater glorious? It speaks of the contrast between law and grace. And the new covenant is not only contrast, but it's also more glorious than the old covenant. A covenant which ministers life is better than one that ministers death. And God's wonderful grace gives life. What kind of life? That leads to the third one. Grace is eternal. It's eternal. Look at verse 11. He says this, For if that which is done away was glorious, much more that which remaineth is glorious. It doesn't fade away. The new covenant, grace, remains and will continue remaining because it's eternal. we got to move, okay? Letter D. Grace functions as a mirror. It's not restricting God's glory. It's reflecting God's glory. It's reflecting God's glory. And you see this there in verses 16 through 18. 
He says, verse 16, Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. When that heart returns to the Lord and turns away from the, from the, from the law and turns to the Lord, guess what? The veil is taken away. What do you think of when you say the veil is taken away? You know what I think of? I think the veil is taken away and you may kiss your bride. It's a great time. The veil is taken away. And you may kiss your bride. Do you know that I'm a bride of Christ? I know I'm an ugly one. But I'm a part of the church who's the actual bride of Christ. And when the veil is taken away, Christ kisses his bride. He loves his bride. And he gives his bride everything she needs. Because he cares for us. And he loves us. Question. Do you remember when that happened to you? Oh, not when you were married. Even though it was a great time. But do you remember when the veil was taken away from you? You know, I do. Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10. I was in Indiana, home. And my dad was beside me. And I read those words that if thou should confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, he said, I believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the mouth, or with the heart, man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made known unto salvation. As a 12 year old boy, I remember saying those words, and those things jumping into my eyes and right into my heart. for the first time I didn't fear where I'd go if I died growing up all those years and going to revivals and hearing messages preached on hell and knowing that I wasn't in Christ I feared for my life. But since that day, all that fear is gone. Because I can rest in Him. Because His grace, it gives eternal life. It's accompanied by unfading glory. It's eternal. It reflects God's glory. Colossians chapter 3 verse 10 says, And have put on the new man, which was renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. I'm made in the image of God, and God loves his son Jesus Christ, and he's transforming me into the image of his one that he loves the most. He wants me to be Christ's life, and that's exactly what verse 18 says. I'm beholding in a mirror, changing from glory to glory because of Jesus Christ. He's transforming you into the image that he wants. And when he's done, you can go on to be home to glory. Betty Norris was done Saturday. He said, Betty, I want you to come home. She said, I don't need these kidneys anymore. Don't need these things. I'm gone. I want to be with him forever. That's what grace does. Law can keep you down. It condemns. It can never give life. 
Grace produces Christ's likeness in the lives of saved Jews and Gentiles. Verse 9 says, For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. And we know that verse, Galatians 2.21, which says, I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness came by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. What's he saying? There's no way that righteousness can come by this law. There's no way. It comes by grace. And grace alone. And finally, grace produces boldness. Grace produces boldness. Look at verse 12. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. He means boldness, courage of speech. Paul was so confident that his message was God's final message to men and that it would fully save all believing sinners that he spoke it openly, he spoke it plainly, and he spoke it boldly. I was in sales for 16 years before becoming a pastor, and I can tell you as a salesperson, if you believe in your product, you can absolutely sell it. If you don't believe in it, you'll never sell it. But if you believe in your product, you can sell it. Because why? It's true. I believe in water when it comes to a fire. Why? Because I've seen it happen. You throw water on a fire and it goes out every time. And it works. I'm confident in that. I'm confident in that. I'm confident in this. That if you'll ask Christ to forgive you of your sins and come into your life and save you, I am confident that he will come into your life and he will save you. And your life will be transformed. And I'm confident it will be the best life you have ever known. Because it's a life of peace and it's a life of rest. Resting in the hands and the arms of the creator of the universe. There's no safer place that I know of than there. It's the perfect place to be. In closing, remember the Judaizers? The Judaizers who had invaded the church at Corinth were depending on the law to change men's lives, but only the Spirit of God can bring about spiritual transformation. The law can bring only bondage, but the Spirit introduces us into a life of liberty. Romans 8.15 says, For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. As a nation... Israel today is spiritually blind, but this does not mean that individual Jews cannot be saved. And the church today needs to recover its lost burden for Israel. We are their debtors because all the spiritual blessings we have come through Israel. Salvation is of the Jews, John 4.22. That's true. And we ought to be grateful. The only way we can pay off this debt is by sharing the gospel with them and praying that they might be saved. As he says in Romans 10 verse 1. Not only the Jews, but also the Gentiles. To every person that we know. Every person is in need of the Savior. So you can't go wrong telling people about the Lord. The greatest gift we've ever received is the gift of Jesus Christ. And when Jesus Christ comes into our life, we have grace. And grace is a wonderful thing. As we think about the gift that we're going to receive or the gift that we're going to be able to give this Christmas season, God's grace is the one gift that you cannot miss the mark of satisfaction. His grace is sufficient for all of humanity. And he wants his grace to be given to everybody who will receive. So I encourage you. You say, I've received his grace. If you have, are you giving his grace to others? Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, body, soul, and strength. And love thy neighbor as thyself. On those two things hangs all the law and the prophets. God's grace. Everything hangs on God's grace. Loving God and loving others. Amen.